people wanted to see this big person who raised Lazarus from the tomb, from the dead. Verse 18, many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So, this is the background. Jesus rides into Jerusalem and the people who are there are all excited because this is the, possibly the Messiah, because in all history of Israel, except for probably one or two in the Old Testament, this was the only one who actually raised a person from the dead. And it's amazing that he raised Lazarus from the dead, not on the third day, but on the fourth day. And I'm not sure if this is true, but uh, part of their culture was, um, don't touch the dead for three days because who knows, he might still come back to life. But on the fourth day, definitely that person's dead. So Jesus waited for the fourth day. Now whether that's true or not, we don't know. But since this is the background of the story on Palm Sunday, we want to find out what actually happened when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Because this makes the whole story even more exciting, interesting. So we're going to watch the prequel. Okay, so we're going back one chapter. That's the prequel. Now, just realize that uh, John was written decades after all this happened. Decades after Jesus went up to heaven. So this whole thing is actually, when you read John back in the first century, you're reading something that has happened before. And people kind of know who, who's who back then. And they know that there were three Marys, probably four. And the question would be, who's, which Mary are we talking about? So we'll go back to chapter 11, just one chapter back, to one week before Palm Sunday. John 11, verse 1. Now it's going to be long, but we'll try to insert some things uh, in the passage uh, to give us a better feel of what's going on. Now how many of us have, have read or, or watched a movie where we could make out who the characters were? That's easy, right? I always find, find myself in that position because I don't know the names of the characters. And we're all, I'm always asking my wife, or she's asking me, what's the name of that guy? <laughs> Who's that person? What happened to him? And especially if you miss the whole story from the beginning, right? You walk into uh, the middle, which was very common back where I came from, you know. We didn't know what time the movie starts, so we would just walk into the movies. <laughs> and then we're kind of like, uh, okay, okay, why is that happening? And then we watch the first part of the movie after the movie. <laughs> we we'll wait for the next show. Verse 11, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany. Bethany is just a few miles away from Jerusalem, so it's not that far. They would normally walk from Bethany to Jerusalem. The village of Mary and her sister Martha. So these are two big names in the Gospels. But a lot of people who are reading the Gospel of John during the first century would not know which Mary. So in verse 2, John explains which Mary. He says, This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. This is the Mary. But you know what? In John chapter 11, this thing hadn't even happened. Mary had not even washed the Lord's feet. With her, with her tears, or, her, uh, or with perfume, and wipe his feet with her hair. So, this actually happened the following chapter. But this is all past. For people who are reading John, this is all past. But if we're breaking into the story in chapter 11, this is actually future. You get it? Okay, but we're not going to read in chapter 12. We're just going to read the, uh, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. 
verse 2. Okay, verse 3. So the sisters sent word to Jesus and saying, Lord, the one you love is sick. So they sent this messenger and as a messenger of an emergency, you want something to happen, right? So this person is sick and he's about to die and you're being sent to go fetch Jesus. So you go there with, uh, you're part of the EMT, the emergency team. And you bring this message to Jesus. But verse 4, amazing. When he heard this, Jesus said, Hey, don't worry. This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now just imagine, here you are, you're the messenger, you're bringing bad news, and you're wanting the doctor to come with you so he could heal Lazarus, the person who's sick. And he says, ah, let's have a cup of coffee. No, sit down, relax. I'm not ready yet. I gotta take a bath first. Yeah. <laughs> Wait for me. And he, he and he's not even like that. He's not even saying, "Wait for a few seconds, or wait for a few minutes, or wait for a few hours." We'll find out later. And he's actually saying, "Hey, wait for a couple of days." I, I don't think Jesus was a Westerner. <laughs> He's not constrained by time. And back in his culture, time was not important. Relationship was more important. Right? Okay. Who feels that time is more important than relationship? So we can't say that, right? But who feels that relationship is more important than time? That's what we find here. That's their culture. Verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister. Funny why John would not even mention Mary's name. Maybe because he mentioned her already. But Jesus, uh, John says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, so the three brother, uh, sisters and brother. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, this is crazy. Normally when you say, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he packed up and went. But this thing that just doesn't make sense. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Didn't make sense. Right? If you were there as a disciple, what would you think? He probably doesn't care, right? But John says Jesus loved the three of them. So he sets you up for, like, Jesus loved them. Really loved them. And so when he heard about this, he decided to stay for two more days. Sometimes God doesn't make sense, right? Here you are, you're sick, and you're wanting God to heal you right now. And we pray, God, please give me patience. And I want it now. <laughs> Sometimes God doesn't make sense. And expect that because... He's God, that's right. Thank you. Verse 7, And then, after two days, he says to his disciples, well, Let's go back to Judea. As if he wasn't in Judea. Or maybe he wasn't, because he was outside. He was probably near the Jordan. So he says, let's, let's go back to Judea. So that's verse 7. I didn't put it up there. Right? Verse 8, and the disciples respond, they say, but Rabbi, or teacher, they said, a short while ago the Jews were uh, there, tried to stone you. 
and yet you are going back? Do you want to get killed? And in the Christian church, it seems to be like we're so concerned about our missionaries who are in ISIS territory or in Iran or Iraq or in places where, um, where it's dangerous. And so we want them back or we pray, God, please protect them. Here we find Jesus saying, hey, let's go back where it's dangerous. Let's go to where I can be killed. <laughs> And the disciples say, oh, hold on, hold on. You just got stoned, almost got stoned. You know, you remember that? I think you remember that. You know everything. So why do you want to go back there? Verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours of daylight? And anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble. Or sometimes we don't have 12 hours of daylight here. Right? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. But, verse 10, It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. Now people judge by appearances. People tend to judge by what they see. You see that it's dangerous to go back to Judea. I see something else. I am the light of the world. Let's walk according not to the light of this world, but according to the light of the world. Verse 11. After he has said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. Oh, okay. Great. He's just sleeping. So that's what the disciples actually thought. Verse 12. His disciples replied, Well, Lord, if he sleeps, he's going to get better. Alright, so we don't have to hurry up. First, Jesus doesn't hurry up. And then he says, he's sleeping. So I guess, you know, it just makes sense for us, for the disciples to say, well, he's going to get better. He's been sleeping for two days. But Jesus had been speaking of his death. But his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. Verse 14. So then he told them plainly. I don't think you guys understand. See, the disciples are, one, cautious, second, confused. And so Jesus explains to them, look, the reality is Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there. What? For your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. So Lazarus is not sleeping, he's dead, he died. You let him die. The person that you love so much, you allowed him to die. Now you're saying, I'm glad I didn't go there. For your sake. Now, all this doesn't make sense so that you may believe. And sometimes things happen to us and we kind of wonder, what's God doing? Is He sitting on His whatever? Trump. Trump. Thank you. You're not doing anything. But somehow, God says, I'm doing this because for what sake? For your sake. So that you may believe. God tends to God tends to offend us. He likes to offend our minds to reveal our heart. And he'll walk into this room and try to offend you. To reveal your heart. Now, for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. And these are the things that God can sometimes do, and it's for the purpose of us coming to the place, a better place of believing Him and having faith in Him. Now, I'm sure this doesn't make much sense to us, because His ways are higher than our. Ways. Amen? Amen? 
tell the person next to you, his ways are higher than our ways. Verse 16, then Thomas, also known as Didymus, which is which means in, in Hebrew Greek, uh, in Hebrew a uh, twin, but it's not that he has a twin, it's more like he's double-minded. He didn't really know what to think. But and, and look at this. He said to the rest of the disciples, he didn't say to Jesus, he said to the rest of the disciples, Well, let's all go, so that we may die with him. Now, the way I put it was more sarcastic, right? Now, I saw a movie, a rendition of what chapter 11 was. He was like saying, hey, let's all go so we can go, I'll die with him. Like, he wanted to die with him. I doubt that. Knowing Thomas, knowing that he didn't believe that Jesus was alive, knowing that he had to put his hand in his side and in his arms, in his hands, to believe that Jesus was actually alive, I think this guy was more sarcastic than that we might allow him to be. He says, let us also go, so that we may die with him, right? Now it's, it's amazing that Jesus didn't even address that attitude of Thomas. Verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. Verse 19, and many Jews who had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. Very natural. In fact, they even hired weavers to come to the funeral and see some of them. Uh, Nicole's going like this, what? <laughs> they hire weepers, people who would mourn, even though they're not really mourning, they would just cry. And it's part of their culture. Verse 20, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Now, did Mary know that Jesus had arrived or not? We don't know. Paul says here that Martha heard that Jesus was coming, so he rushed out the door, met Jesus along the way, and in verse 21, her response was, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Now, looking at just that verse, it's kind of like, Martha believed that Jesus would raise him up from the dead. But it doesn't look like it in verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha replied, I know he will rise again. Not today, but in the resurrection of the last day. So she believed that there would be a resurrection in the last day. In verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. Amen. You're waiting for the resurrection. The resurrection is here in front of you now. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Now he's saying they are going to live even though they die physically they're going to live. Spiritually. And whosoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? So he, instead of, well, Martha comes and says, You should have been here. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus says, Well, do you believe? And Mar Martha says in verse 27, Yes, Lord, I believe. I believe you're the Messiah, you're the Son of God, who has come to the world. Verse 28, after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary. So the conversation ends there. She says, I believe, yeah, I believe. I believe you're the Messiah. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe in the resurrection. I believe you're going to raise him up in the future. 
she takes off, goes back home, talks to Mary, and whispers to her, hey, teacher is here, and is asking for you. Now, I kind of wonder whether Jesus actually asked for Mary, because it doesn't say in the scriptures. It didn't say that Jesus asked for him, for her. But Martha runs to Mary and says, hey, teacher, the one that you really like so much, you always wanted to sit at her, his feet, you know? Like, you never want to help me out. <laughs> They're always sitting there. You're not supposed to be sitting there. You're a woman. You can't be a disciple. Hey, he's asking for you. So Mary, verse 29, when she heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still outside Bethany at the place where Martha had met him. Verse 31, when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her. See, we have all these weepers and family and friends. They all follow Mary, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. Verse 32, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. Martha didn't fall down at his feet, but Mary did. And said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now both Martha and Mary had the same thought. Notice that? Same thought. If you had been here, he would not have died. Probably they, they both said it in different tones. Yeah. One was accusing, the other one was saying, why didn't you come? Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. He empathized with Mary. Now see this, two different people, two different responses, and Jesus responds to them in two different ways. Did you notice that? Even if you had the same problems? Probably not. Sometimes we think that we should respond to everyone in the same way, one size fits all. And that's so very human of us because it's easier to say, this is the way we're gonna do it, and if you don't like it, shut up and sit down. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's the way we like to do it, it's easy. God is different. He looks at you, he looks at your personality, he looks at what you've been through, and what you're going through, and he responds in a different way. That's the kind of compassion that God has. He looks at you and he doesn't look at you as the same as the other person. He knows you from your heart and he wants to respond to you in the way that you need him to respond to you. Verse 34. And he doesn't even talk to Mary. He talks to the crowd and says, where have you laid him? Where is he? He doesn't even, probably he doesn't even walk into Bethany. He walks straight to the, to the graveyard. And they all said, come and see, Lord. They replied, Jesus wept when he saw the place where Lazarus was. Jesus wept. Then the, Je the Jews said, see how he loved him? Wow. Jesus loved him so much. Verse 37. But some of them said, hey, you know what, if he came here and if he could open the eyes of the blind man, he could have kept this guy from dying. Right? And we look at our situations and we say, well, if God could have done a miracle for that person, what's keeping him from doing a miracle for me now? It's so very natural for us to think that God would do the same thing exactly for what He did for you. He would do the same thing for me. 
And if he gave you a million dollars, I would expect a million dollars for you, for, for me. And if he kept you from an accident, I would expect him to keep me from an accident. And because he healed you from cancer, I expect him to heal me from diabetes. Like right now. Verse 38, but Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And like what we see in the scriptures, those stones are heavy. It will take a number of people to move that stone. It's stone part and it looks like it's a circle. And they roll it down and it's hard to remove it because uh, the way it's, the way the place is done, it's in wine. How do you move that stone out? It takes a lot of people to move that out. It takes a lot less people to move it down, a lot more people to move it back out. He says, so there's a stone laid across the entrance. Verse 39, and this is what Jesus says, take away the stone. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> We need Herschel, we need Glenn, we need Dennis, we need everyone here. And Leon, can you please stand up too? You know? We need to move this stone. But Lord, so Martha, Martha reacts and said, Hey look, by this time there is a bad odor. Four days. For he has been there for four days. Are you kidding me? You want to open this? What are you trying to do? Right? Verse 40, then Jesus said, Didn't I tell you just a while ago that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Now he responds to Martha in a very different way than he responds to Mary. This response to the crowd is going to be different from all the other characters in this story. This response to Lazarus was different. We'll find out in a while. Verse 41, so they took away the stone. They had a hard time. <laughs> then Jesus looked up and said, probably raised his hands. And this is funny here. You'll never see Jesus when he prays, you'll never see Jesus lowering his head. So how can you guys always lower your head when you pray? You'll always see Jesus looking up to heaven and talking to the Father. Now if you guys have seen the Messiah, the young Messiah, how many of you have seen that movie? It's a beautiful movie. Did you like it? Yeah. You did? What part did you like? All of it. All of it. There are, there are certain moments in that movie and it's still showing. So if you guys want to see a good movie, go see The Young Messiah. It's not entirely historical, but the point about this is his relationship with his father. That's the part that I love. You, you'll see a different Jesus in the way he responds to his father. Now his response was, he looks up to heaven and says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Oh. He hasn't even prayed about this yet, has he? Not in the story. He probably prayed the night, you know, in the evening. But he says, I thank you that you have heard me. I haven't even seen it happen, but I know that you have heard me. Verse 42, I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. So here it is. His response to the crowd was, I'm going to pray a prayer that is loud enough for everyone to hear. And I'm going to pray a prayer that I already have prayed. And I'm going to say, I'm thank you, thank you that you heard me. Thank you that you always hear me. Why? So that the crowd may believe. So that the crowd may believe. Mm. 
Verse 43, when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, and here's his response to Lazarus. You ever find yourself like in a dark place? Or you, you feel helpless and hopeless? Now Lazarus was dead. He had no, un, no knowledge of what was happening. And Jesus' response was, Lazarus, come out. And sometimes God needs to speak to us to give us an instruction. And it just depends on who we are and how we are and what situation we're in. He'll speak to us in a way that we need. For Lazarus, he says, come out. For all the people around, he shouts out and says, come out. Now, why did Jesus not walk inside the tomb and lay hands on him? There's no formula. When, when the centurion came to Jesus and asked that you heal my servant, what did he say? I'm not coming to you. Centurion says, you don't have to do that. Just say the word. Jesus said, wow, that's the kind of faith I like. So he just says the word and the person gets healed, right? A woman walks up to him and touches his cloak. And he says, who touched me? And everyone was around him. You know, it's, it's like you, you're walking out with Thomas and Mac and everyone is just pushing each other. You're trying to walk out. Or you're walking out the movie house on a day when, on the night when Star Wars was showing, right? And people were just crowding you and he says, who touched me? Why well, everyone, the disciples respond and say, What do you mean you, who touched you? Everyone's touching you. Why God touched you? So here Jesus says, Come out. Instead of walking in and raising him up, he says, Come out. There was a dead uh, teenager that Jesus met along the way when they were coming out of the city. And instead of saying, rise up, he touched his hand and said, rise up. Verse 44, the dead man didn't even say Lazarus. <laughs> he just said, hey, you know what? He's dead. So I want you to know, the guy is dead. The dead man, not a zombie, the dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped up with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Now, if you have linen wrapped around you and a cloth around your face, wouldn't you stand up and try to pull that? Why is this thing on me anyway? Right? But the guy didn't even do that. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Now he didn't say, Lazarus, remove that, that silly cloth in front of your face. Can, can you see? Like, can you see that there's something in front of you? Why don't you remove that? He didn't say that. Yeah. He didn't say, hey, look at you. You should look in the mirror. Let me go or not. He says, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Let's go back. Let's do a little summary. Mary, the weeper, she just likes to cry. <laughs> Martha, very rational, right? She's a doer, we find out in another story. She likes to do things. Now some of us just love to minister. And we can't stick around and sit in a chair and listen to a message. You gotta go do something, you know, or antsy. They had an urgent message. So they were in a hurry. The disciples, they were cautious. 
they want to get they, they didn't want to get their heads chopped off. They were confused. They've been with Jesus for three years, and what there's they still don't know who Jesus is. And some of the things that Jesus says always confused. Now, how long have you been walking with Jesus? And some of us are still confused. And Thomas, he was sarcastic. Lazarus, he was helpless. The crowd, they were amazed. They were amazed that Jesus actually wept for Lazarus. But all they could see was what Jesus did before and can't even see what Jesus can do. So they're still living by, uh, their faith is by sight. Now look at how Jesus responds. To Mary, the weeper, he responds with empathy. Doesn't even say a word to her. He doesn't even say, hey, don't worry. This, was, this is what Henry Nolan, if you've heard that name, he talks about the healing presence, just being there. Just, just being there with a person who's grieving is actually healing. Don't have to say a word. And I have pulled the bereavement group and some of the things that they complain about, they complain about their family and friends not understanding how they feel. Because family and friends will always say, hey, you gotta get over that, you gotta move on. Hey, why don't you get married again? You know, and they come to the bereavement group to get support, and I'm just there to listen to them. I tell them, I tell them hey, we want to hear your story. Tell us your story. What's happening to you? What happened to you in the last two weeks? And I'm just there as a healing presence. And sometimes, and if you know of anyone who's grieving, just be there. Don't tell them what to do. Don't tell them what to think. Don't tell them how to feel. They're grieving. They're so, they're so in that, in that tomb, in the dark place, and they can't get out. And you telling them what to do will not help them get out. Empathy. That's what how Jesus responded. Martha, the rational doer, how did he respond? He said, Believe. You've been thinking too much. And some of us here came to this church because we like the theology. We think too much. We're more cognitive. And this is what Jesus wants you to do. Believe. The messengers, they had an urgent message. And here is Jesus' response. Relax. Hey, we've got we've got plenty of time. We got two days. No, in fact, we got four days. The disciples, they were cautious, confused, and sarcastic. Jesus' response was, Hey, don't get out of focus here. You know, just remember I'm heading to Jerusalem and that's where I intend to die. Focus on the mission. And because they were confused, he responds with an explanation. No, he's not sleeping. <laughs> he's dead. Lazarus. He was helpless. And Jesus' response was, he wept. And he also said, come out. The crowd who were amazed by uh, who were amazed and were living by faith, but a kind of faith that was faith by sight. He tells them to get involved. Stop sitting there. Get involved. Stop looking at the signs and the wonders. Get involved. He says, take away the stone. And finally he says, take off the grave clothes. See, Jesus responds in different ways to each one. 
according to our needs. He's not going to respond to Glenn in the same way that he responds to Tess. He's not going to respond to Rob in the same way that he responds to Pepper. He's not going to respond to Michael in the same way that he responds to Jim. We're all different. And that's where we need to tolerate each other. We need to have tolerance for each other. We're not all the same. And some of us, we don't even know, actually have disorders which have never been diagnosed. And we can't just change the other person just because we think, this is the standard, therefore you need to shut up and sit down. <laughs> Jesus' response was, believe. Take away the stone. Come out. Take off the great clothes. See, last time I spoke here, we talked about renewal. And this is the second part of the series. Renewal starts with a life-changing encounter with Jesus. But renewal doesn't stop there. Renewal continues and it deepens as we become more deeply involved in listening to Jesus and in serving each other. That's what community is all about. You know, you find a need, you serve that need. You see a person who need who is needy, go serve that way. You find a person who is deep in depression, go be with that person. You find a person who is grieving, go sit right next to that person. Sit still. Just be with that person. You find a person who has a psychological problem, go be with that person. Do something that will help that person. You see, the reason that God called us out of this world together into a community is so that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. So that we can serve each other. That's what community is all about. Renewal continues through and in community. And if we're not part of a community, we're being Westerners. Very personal. I have a personal religion. I have a personal relationship with God. Stay out of my space. Go do your own thing. I'll do my own thing. Mind your own business. I'll mind my own business. And we're Christians. And see you in heaven. <laughs> right? That's not the way. That's not what God called us to. He called us to be part of a community. Koinonia, that's a word you'll find in the scriptures. It means community. It means fellowship. That's the economy of Jesus Christ. We need renewal, and that renewal starts with a life-changing encounter with Jesus, but it continues as we listen to Him, as He responds to us, and as we respond to the needs in our community. Inside, right now in this community. Amen? Amen? So please look around you and realize you're not an island. Remember that song? No man is not an island. So let's, this is Palm Sunday, so it's supposed to be a celebration. But it's a reminder for us that when Jesus went to Jerusalem on that Sunday, the story was not didn't happen in a vacuum. The story didn't happen just like that. There were prequels. A lot of things happened before that, and this is one of the things that happened. 
and God wants to touch us. God wants to touch you. He wants to respond to you in the way that you need. And He also wants you to get involved in the 